So how much do storage facilities actually make? Well, we recently purchased a 50,000 net rentable square foot facility. We purchased it for 2.5 million. We were a little nervous about this just because it needed so much work. So we had room for expansion and we purchased it at what we believed was a great price for the value that we had. In this video, I'm gonna walk you through how we found value, what we had to do, and what you can do too. And you're gonna be able to see exactly how much we make on this 50,000 square foot facility. All right, when you see facilities, lots of times they're really optimized, meaning that the square footage is all used. As you can see with this, you have line of units, we have all sorts of different types of units, maybe big, small ones, but the ground, it looks nice, it's all paved. Every piece of this is being used. This one here is really high-end, it's indoor climate controlled. You guys, if you live in big cities, have seen this. They're on the side of freeways. They may be multi-stories, but that's not the norm. Most facilities are smaller facilities, mom and pop own, gravel or drive up, that are maybe old, outdated, and they're not even run well. That really does make up most storage facilities in the United States. Outside these nice, fancy ones, storage facilities broken up and fragmented by individual owners. And these facilities are everywhere. You've probably seen them. They're all over the place. And the opportunity with storage resides very much in turning these assets around. When we looked at this facility that was 50,000 square feet, it had a lot of potential. So we put $800,000 in, all said and done, we were right around 3.8, mainly through operations. I didn't wanna come in and do huge capital expenditures. It had room to expand, but the improvements that we made had nothing to do with us building. It had nothing to do with us turning around the asset and reshaping it and doing a whole lot of work, nothing like that. It was mainly just through operations. Operations, like what does that actually mean and what do we have to do? Well, the facility that we purchased was ran basically out of a notebook, right? Now, they did have some software, but they weren't running it like a business. They had tenants and they optimized for less work, not really optimizing for revenue. For an example, you have different units in storage facilities. Now, these three units right here, right? They all look the same, all four of these, this whole row here until you get to that big one. They're exact same size, exact same location, right? But each one of these units actually gets a different price. Somebody moved in at the street rate, call it $100 that they're renting. But we may have somebody else that they actually moved in two years ago and they're not getting $100, which is today's price, they paid $50. And that hasn't changed. So when we look at that facility, we're saying there's a gap, meaning this one's $100 because that's today's going rate in the market. But this one who was in two years ago is paying 50. That gap is simply because owners didn't want to do things like raise rates. That's an easy gap that we can close. Another thing that owners will do is sometimes you have units that are open. Now this open from vacancy either comes from not marketing or two, we may have units that are actually locked, but nobody's paying. Those units we look at and we say, you need to pay. It's not groundbreaking, but it's actually a big deal. A lot of facilities may have up to five to 10% of the units where the individuals are either late or they haven't paid for months. That's a big change, 10%, making those people pay, that's 10% in gross revenue. That's really a lot of what I mean by operations. These little things have a huge impact on revenue. And for a lot of mom and pop facilities across the United States, that's all you need to do to really change that revenue. So let's take a look. Expense ratios are dictated by the operations of the facility. Now, different models and different operating models like automation or fully staffed will have a different expense ratio. As of this last month, we're making roughly 30,000 a month, right? At a 30% expense ratio, which even that's kind of high on a facility the size, but at a 30% expense ratio, we're netting $250,000 a year. All right, I'm gonna be honest. Um, I kind of felt that we were overpaying a little when we bought this. And the reason being is on actual revenue to the facility and how much it was making in that income, it wasn't a lot. 
Uh, and the reason being was because of all those things that we talked about earlier. So we kind of paid a premium. And the question is then, why did you pay for a premium for a facility that's not a big, nice facility? Well, the reason why I was willing to pay a premium is because of that untapped revenue that was just sitting there. It wasn't even a risk. It's not like we expected the market to go up. It's just that we knew you have all these units. Some of them aren't even paying. Others are paying substantially lower to what we're already getting. So that price already exists. We just need to clean it up. For this asset, we needed to do everything from seal coats, asset, um, asphalt, excuse me, repairs. Then we needed to do office remodels, cameras. We had software, gate relocations, some pretty heavy stuff. Everything from roofs that needed fixed. Uh, they were rough. One of the downsides when you have huge revenue potential, it usually means there's a lot of work. And a lot of work can be capital intensive. Until you're stabilized, that really drives up our total operating expenses. So as you can see, the total operating expenses is really high, especially for an asset on that side. And that means in that short term, your net operating income will be much, much lower, right? So gross income is what our focus is on these assets. You drive gross revenue up by reestablishing new value within the asset you need to remove bad tenants and tenants that are in for just prices because as you change the value of the asset you need to change the customers that want that higher value this happens in seasons so although we were doing heavy heavy work through that first two year period, which also during this time, as you can see, was COVID, which made it really rough to get work and help done. We'd already seen a huge jump in revenue to from 30,000 to over 50,000. Now, this is represented, we have high and low season. So this is a down season. So we're moving into the slow season, which revenue follows. But also during that time, we are actively kicking people out. So our occupancies are also going down. Now you can see we're not even in the busy season yet and revenue has already started to go up and up by a lot. Really the busy season is March, April, May. So this will go past uh, 60,000, especially as we stabilize occupancy of the people that we've been kicking out. This is not a short term thing, right? A lot of people want light switches, but when you're going to double the gross revenue of an asset, uh, lots of times it's not something that's very easy. We knew this was going to be a long haul. The great side is as this revenue goes up, our operating expenses are going to continue to drop because the asset is now stabilizing. And that means your margin, right? Your gross revenue to your expenses it grows both ways. Revenue's now gone up, operating expenses now go down, that margin expands, that goes to net income. So although we may have 2.5x our gross revenue, so more than doubled it, what will happen on the net operating income is that will be three or four times higher than where we purchased it. And value is placed on net income. That means that we should be netting more than right now, we're almost there, than what we purchased at gross revenue total. So we will net income more than the gross revenue in total was. That is massive value creation, obviously. Our $800,000, we are getting almost 50% of that um, at stabilization and net income. That is the goal and that's what we're shooting for. But remember, that took all of this work. That also took in the biggest down cycle we have seen in self-storage. We had COVID and the biggest down cycle we had seen. Now, while COVID helped us out in occupancies, that was not good for this facility. The reason being is it helped in occupancy, but we couldn't get laborers to do works like move gates, finish the roofing. So the it it was good because there was high demand, but it was bad because we couldn't capitalize on the demand at the prices we needed to make it work. So that actually didn't benefit us. And then of course, moving in to the slow season, but the slow season combined with the largest drop we've seen in uh, self-storage history, even through there, even on our downside, during that big drop, everything else, we are still 
way over 50% above the gross revenue. It's about long-term value. What we try to avoid is that any time in here, there is a value trap. You know, I talk about that a lot. A value trap would be all of a sudden, we have to either sell or maybe we have to change interest rates and interest rates now shot up to 9%. Well, that is why we give ourselves a large amount of time to capitalize on that value. I want our interest rates to be out 10 years because during the time that our value improvements go, there's factors that we can't control. And I don't want to get trapped. As long as we have long-term fundamentals, long-term value, a long-term value proposition, we can execute on it and that will yield stellar results. Right now, at this rate, the market that we're talking about is far worse than here. When we were here, it was 95% plus occupancy with rates in the market going up 15%. Here, the market is down by, you know, at we're sitting at around 80% occupancy and rates have gone down by 30% or roughly 25% on average to 30%. So that's how I look at this and say, to me, it's almost more conservative. It is not something that you can buy, just sit on and it just magically happens. This is value creation. We have to create it. That means we also have to be conservative. We have to hold off returns. We have to hold on to cash as we're doing it. But the long-term fundamentals are so good, even in downturns and risks, we know we can exercise on it. We put 800,000 down and the net income is 250,000, right? That's a really good return. And we haven't even done the expansions. We haven't even fully done rent raises or optimization yet. And I think there's even more potential than that. Obviously we can build, we can add on, we expand. That potential is still going. And that's really what I like to see. And when we measure how much that makes in cleanup, the number was huge. In fact, we doubled gross revenue, but the expenses don't double. So I was willing to be more aggressive and buy that at a higher price because to me, it wasn't worth 2.5 million. It was actually worth closer to four. And that was regardless of what the market did, if the market went up or not. I could lock in interest at the time for 4% for a decade. That is a big driver of what I take out because whatever that debt payment you have is, is gonna come out of that gross revenue. So you have expenses, then you have debt payments. So the bigger that debt payment is, the less money you put into your pocket. So I could lock in favorable terms and I had huge revenue upside. So I was willing to be aggressive. And now we can see how that played out just after a year and a half. If you found this valuable and would like to see more, make sure you like and subscribe and put a comment below on what you're seeing in the market.